comments afterwards. So I believe that's uh, that's recorded now. So just to give a huge welcome to everyone, um, and thank you, thank you for coming along to this event. So this is our careers and conservation event. Um, my name is Matthew, and I'm the president of Biosoc at the University of Leeds. Also, I have Hannah, uh, the vice president of Biosoc, with me. Uh, so yeah, as I said before, this session's been recorded and it'll be distributed after the event. Um, so if, you, if you'd like to watch it back, just drop us an email. Um, so tonight, Leeds BiSoc are, jo are joined by an incredible panel of nine speakers from right across the conservation sector. So we have Francesca Trotman, who's the founder and managing director of the Oceans. We have Sasha Dench, who is the United Nations ambassador for migratory species and the founder of uh, Conservation Without Borders. We have Heather Cole Dewey, who's a senior technical advisor at the Zoological Society of London and the National Geographic Fellow and the co-founder of Project Seahorse. We have Tara Proud, who's the volunteer and community engagement manager at the Marine Conservation Society. Hazel Jackson, who's the head of conservation outcomes and evidence at the Woodland Trust. Prue Anderson, who's a con conservation strategy director at the Berks Box and Oxen Wildlife Trust and an associate editor of two conservation journals. Lisa Kerslake, who's the Director of Operations at the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust and a founding member of the Chartered Institute of Ecology and Environmental Management. Rebecca Lavelle, who is a Species Conservation Assessor at World Botanical Gardens Q. And finally, Morvis Gore, who is the Co-Director of Marine Conservation at National and a DEFRA Inspector for Zoos and Aquaria. Um, so without further ado, I will hand over to each of those speakers um, to give a short little introduction to themselves. Um, and then we'll open up the floor uh, to a Q&A session. So if you have any questions throughout the, the presentations in the next half an hour or so, then please just use the chat function. If you want to direct that specific speaker, then um, also include that. Um, and then once we open the floor, feel free to put on your, your mic and camera if you'd like to ask your camera in person. So um, I'll hand over to Francesca. Hi, everybody. I'm just going to share my screen with everyone um, so that you guys can see my slides. Hopefully you're all seeing slides that aren't too blurry. The internet is not great yeah. here. Yeah, I'm talking to you from Mozambique, so just bear with me. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, I am the founder of an organization called Love the Oceans. Um, we are based in Mozambique. Our mission is to establish a marine protected area here. Um, so everything we do is working towards that. So we do a lot of different areas of research and community outreach. Um, we do fisheries research, humpback whales, coral reefs, ocean trash, and marine megafauna, and we run three community outreach programs um, too. So um, this slide just kind of um, demonstrates the holistic approach that we take to conservation, and it's something that Love the Oceans is pretty passionate about. Um, so the idea with the marine protected area is that it's a completely sustainable model so uh, Love the Oceans won't be running it, it's locally led so that's where the education section is so important. Uh, so within the education section we teach basic marine resource management to 10 to 13 year olds, we also teach swimming to 4 to 18 year olds and we work with the active fishermen as well um, talking about sustainability and conservation um, subjects too. Uh, and then we have our research, uh, so we're the only NGO working in this district, uh, it's the first ever time there's ever been any research in this area which is um, exciting because obviously every project that we come up with is the first time it's been done but it's also pretty daunting because you have to develop the methodologies from scratch and there's no historic data set to base it off um, which does mean that you kind of have to do a baseline survey to understand what's going on before you can do anything about the situation. Um, so all research is being used to inform legislation change and we also do uh, whale shark and manta ray research um, so uh, it's megafauna in general we are also expanding our dolphin database next year as well uh, and that is really to prove uh, that we can basically guarantee a tourist a sighting of these what we call sexy species of marine animals um, so it's very feasible ecotourism species um, uh, it's ecotourism area uh, and ecotourism is the alternate source of income that we encourage fishermen to swim switching towards. Um, we then have our fisheries research uh, and that is um, an extension of what I did my master's on which is how I formed
platforms love the oceans initially uh, and that's looking at the sustainability of the different types of fishing here uh, and also helping inform legislation change around that um, and limit different fishing activities we have our ocean trash database which obviously we all know that there's tons of trash around the world washing up on the beaches um, so I won't go into too much detail on that one um, but it's the practical side of uh, removing trash and then also looking at how to use it uh, upcycle it so that it's um, upcycled and reused and not just being burnt which is typically how plastic and trash is disposed of here um, and then we have our coral reef research which is basically trying to prove that what we have is worth protecting and then with all of our research as well um, it all feeds back into our community work so at the moment I'm launching a sustainable fishing project with Pascal our community outreach manager Gemo the chief fisherman here and Silver the community elder um, and we're working um, hard to move the fishermen away from unsustainable methods of fishing like netting for instance and um, towards more sustainable fishing which our research has shown um, is kayak fishing um, so uh, that's, I'm actually leaving at 2.30 tomorrow morning to go and pick up all the kayaks um, and drive them up here but that's kind of how uh, everything kind of rolls together and we also have our sustainability section which is about because uh, we work with the community that lives below the poverty line you can't just tell people they can't fish we're in a coastal country and fish is such an important source of protein um, so the sustainability section is really about um, providing alternate sources of income so that's a little bit of a sustainable fishing project so um, being enabling people to fish more sustainably and live more sustainably identifying barriers that, that stand in people's way so for instance with ecotourism if you can't swim then you're going to struggle to lead a snorkel tour right so that's where the swimming project comes in uh, and then with our sustainable livelihoods that's more like aquaponics and sustainable honey harvesting and things like that uh, which provide an alternate source of income which alleviates pressure on the ocean because the ocean's not under so much pressure to provide uh, a financial source of income and food um, so that's really us in a nutshell I did have some pretty visuals but um, yeah. they kind of fall into what I've already talked about already um, so I'll skip over them uh, we do have a bunch of impacts but I'm also aware that I've already spoken for longer than I meant to um, so you can check out the impacts on our website um, and that I think we might have just lost Francesca at the end there um, she is actually in Mozambique at the minute if anyone uh, missed that and there's a there's a big storm in common which affects her uh, her internet so we'll um we'll move on to um sasha now if that's okay Sorry, I was muted. I've been speaking all that time. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was just saying, um, as I've understood it, we've got about three minutes and you kind of want career path primarily, yeah? How we yes. got to where we are. Okay, so I'll, I'll touch on very briefly the couple of projects we've got in the pipeline at the moment. But so my, I have probably earn a reasonably unusual um, career progression going from being a marine turtle geneticist to the human swan and uh, an ambassador for migratory species. Um, and I suppose I was just going to try and in three minutes give you a bit of a summary of a couple of moments that that took me from kind of definitely a biologist that's all I really wanted to do um, and how I've got to where I am now and so I think the summary of, of uh, me is I had a childhood which was very much outdoors um, I was given liberty in the Australian bush so our house actually burnt down in the fires in January so we lost uh, all the kind of wildlife that I grew up with but it was it was pretty wild and we had the freedom to go camping for days on end my nearest neighbor nearest friend was about uh, an hour and a half walk away and we didn't have telephones so I'd have to walk there to see if she was home or not and then sometimes walk back because she wasn't but in that time you know you learn to make use of that time and do stuff play in the river on the way there so I had quite grew up with quite a lot of confidence in how behaving and the world around me feeling like a part of it so that is probably a key a key thing um a second thing is 
obviously I went through, I went through um, uh, university, um, got to, um, yeah, ended up being a, a marine turtle geneticist and found myself working in South America on a couple of projects. And on those projects, I kept butting up against the idea, which I think people talk about quite openly in, in college, but I don't think I really quite understood the, um, the, the importance of um, like one thing being data and the other thing is that people don't necessarily take data and then react rationally to that information. So I ended up becoming quite fascinated by the different ways in which you can actually, the science, I suppose, of working with people to change their behavior. Um, once you had the data as a background, the data wasn't necessarily the big thing. And then I found myself years later back in Australia, having worked in various places. Um, and I started a big volunteer group of mostly divers who I realized were getting kind of bored of their diving. And I started looking for things that, you know, all this, all this sort of dive time and brains and cameras could do. So we started looking at the seagrass, um, seagrass beds where uh, yachts were dragging anchors through the seagrass beds. Um, what could we do about that? The, where there was um, areas of reef which were completely matted with fishing line, um, shark nets and how they worked. I kept looking at them thinking if people understood that this is what the reality was underwater, if they could see that, I think they would help us change it. I don't think this is a difficult thing to solve. People just aren't aware of it. So there's me as a kind of a scientist giving people information and that was kind of got that level of interest. And then I started going down there with cameras and filming it to try and get like, you know, emotive shots as well, you know, light behind the dead, you know, small hammerhead stuck in a shark net. That was maybe kind of slightly more interesting. So suddenly people were more interested once I had strong visuals. And then I became Australian freediving champion. And suddenly people were that much interested in everything I had to say about the marine world. And I fought it for ages. I was so horrified by the fact that as a scientist, people weren't as interested as they ought to have been in the facts. But as soon as I was a freeder and I, or I could swim along the shark nets with a monofin looking like a mermaid, suddenly 60 minutes wanted to cover it. And I eventually decided to give up on fighting that and just go with it. Um, so I ended up using the kind of freediving platform for different things, but that really formed for me, the, the, the interest in using storytelling, but also telling the stories of other researchers. So for the last 15 years, I've been working in comms with conservationists telling those stories. And I suppose that was a, that was a way that I ended up um, at WWT being asked to work with scientists there and then came up with the idea of actually bringing to life the journey of this bird that was in decline by flying with them and that just took it to another level and that's where I've ended up um, doing more of that now. Now I've well and truly gone over my three minutes. <laughs> no worries at all. It's, a, it's fantastic, thank you. Um, so if we can move on to Heather now. Thank you. Um, well there's some nice commonalities um, from Sasha apart from the free diving championship part <laughs> which I've never <laughs> achieved um, but I think that thinking about key moments and I called them swerves rather than moments in careers was important. So I wanted to be a vet, had too much fun doing A-levels um, and my backup plan was studying marine and freshwater biology at university um, in Plymouth. And off the back of my undergrad project, I was fortunate to get an offer to do a PhD, uh, which was on genetics, um, and, but on fish population genetics in Wales. And what mattered to me about that was doing something that was very innovative and cutting edge at the time, a bit different, um, getting out in the field, which I absolutely love, uh, and actually hearing the issues firsthand from uh, the fishers that I was working with. Um, so I loved applied science. I loved science that matters right from the outset. But after doing um, a couple of postdocs, one at, in Stockholm and one at the Institute of Zoology, I realized that I didn't want to head down the tenure track career. So my next swerve was uh, going for a job as curator of London Zoo Aquarium as a bet for a bottle of wine. Um, so really rational career track um, and somehow got that job. Um, and that's really where the conservation started to, to blossom because I was given the opportunity working for the Zoological Society of London to build conservation that wasn't really happening for fish um, in aquariums in the same way as it was for uh, fluffy animals in zoos. So I really built that, um, particularly off the back of seahorses, which I'd done as a genetics um, project to identify species being sold in markets. Um, and that led to co-founding Project Seahorse, which was a more holistic approach to seahorse conservation in 1996. 
Now, over time, I realized my fish husbandry skills were pretty rubbish, um, but surrounded myself with great people. Um, and that's been a core of my career has been realizing I can't do everything on my own, um, but doing it, there's lots of clever, brilliant people out there to collaborate with. So I've got a real mixed bag of projects that range from saving seahorses in the Philippines, dealing with discarded fishing nets, to um, working on some of the most remote marine protected areas on the planet. Mm -hmm. But the common themes are doing things I love, getting out in the field, being able to do authentic work on the front line um, and sticking with that and working really, really hard. Conservation's a tough career, but also an amazing one. Thank Perfect. you. Thanks, Heather. Moving on to Tara. Cool. Hopefully you can see my screen. Yeah. Cool. Um, so yeah, actually really great to hear everyone else's stories. I think there'll be more commonalities coming out of mine too. So yeah, I'm Tara. Thanks for inviting me to be involved this evening. So I work for Marine Conservation Society, the UK's leading marine charity. Um, I've worked here as a volunteer and community engagement manager for four years or so. Um, so in this role, I, it's quite varied. I'm out and about a lot on beaches. I work with our network of volunteers all across Scotland and also communities kind of linking people together and empowering folk to, to connect so that we can influence policy change to protect the marine environment, obviously in collaboration with a lot of partners. Um, I also do things like teaching folk about marine ecology so they can get engaged with citizen science, um, collecting some of the data to underpin our policy. Um, I work a lot with coll colleagues on policy uh, work directly with government and things like that as well. I also do a lot of teaching children about marine conservation and um, so before COVID that was in classrooms and on beaches. It's more webinars on Zoom these days but hopefully I'll go back to beaches soon. Um, so how did I get into this? So I did two biology degrees so straight up biology not marine biology um, but kind of in common with folk who've spoken before me I grabbed every opportunity to do field work, field work and any hands-on conservation. So a lot of that was actually in my spare time volunteering between university and work um, and if anyone's wondering what the cute little bird I'm holding there is it's a puffling so a baby puffin. Um, I then between my two degrees I took a year I first worked I volunteered unpaid for the Marie, uh, Mauritian Wildlife Foundation for six months. If you don't know their work I highly recommend checking them out um, they do incredible conservation work. I learned an incredible amount about real hands-on conservation whilst I was there. Um, I then came back to the UK and did my first paid conservation role with the RSPB, reintroducing white-tailed eagles, so those amazing birds in the photo, back to Scotland. I then worked for the RSPB for five years in lots of different roles, mostly desk-based. Um, I was policy officer and then species recovery international kind of role, but a real highlight um, was getting back to the field. I led a three and a half month um, expedition, a very small team of five scientists, to an incredibly remote island in the South Pacific. Um, for me, it was great to get back out there in the field, do some real conservation and science. Um, and whilst I was there, I saw the shocking scene that you can see here, this beach absolutely covered in marine litter. And for me, it just reignited my passion for the marine environment. And hence I applied to work with marine conservation. So yeah, that's my story. Um, but I was thinking in advance of this, the sort of three top bits of advice I was thinking about careers would be, firstly, there is absolutely no single route into conservation. I think you're probably getting that already. Um, and also the jobs in conservation are really varied. Um, also stick to what you love and what you're good at. Um, and then the third thing was about volunteering, not just to get into conservation, but I think you can volunteer at every and any stage of your career. I still volunteer today and it's a really good way to kind of keep actively involved and engaged in other things you're passionate about. So that's, that's me for now. Thanks, Tara. Perfect. And I believe Hazel's next. I'm going to attempt to share two. Uh, so much like Tara said, there is no straight route into conservation and mine by no means was not an ordinary one, a very strange one. And I think I'm on about career number four right now. So my first career was an accidental one. I always wanted to be a primatologist. Apes were my passion and my love growing up. And somehow I ended up working for the civil service for eight years as a bailiff and a debt collector, which 
I was very good at, but absolutely hated. So in my mid twenties, I went off to university and finally got to do some wildlife conservation. Um, oh, and I now, my, my screen's frozen. Oh, devastating. All right, forget that. Anyway, I'll carry on. I was going to show you some pretty pictures of monkeys. But anyway, so I went to university. I did a degree in wildlife conservation. I moved up through academia, did a, a PhD in the end in genetics also. As some other ladies here has, has done. Not in primates, though. I did a PhD on our uh, non-native ringneck parakeets that we have in this country and beyond. So I've been studying those birds now for a very long time. I then decided again after having been in academia for about 13 years, I moved on to a number of postdoc roles, went off to the Seychelles, did some field work, absolutely loved it, but academia was no longer for me. And I took a role as a director of science for a charity. Uh, this was not a conservation charity. This was a charity called Animal Free Research UK, which was a biomedical research charity and it funded um, research to basically stop animal testing. So it's very interesting. Um, and I, I learned a lot from it, but I found whenever anybody asked me what my job was, I said, well, it's not conservation, but. <laughs> so so uh, after a year I left and I was very lucky enough to get my current role, career number four, which is the head of conservation outcomes and evidence at the Woodland Trust. Um, it's a fascinating job, it's really demanding. My, my role is more desk-based than perhaps I, I would have intended, but actually I, what I really love about it is that I run a fantastic team which comprises lots of ecologists, experts, we run citizen science projects, lots of work on the ground and in the field, and our function is to really provide all that kind of conservation evidence that underpins everything and all the delivery and advocacy and influencing that the entire organisation does. So it's a really interesting cross-cutting sort of functional team which challenges me on a daily basis. And you know I'm really lucky because we also have a research funding programme and I'm an active affiliate at the, research, at the University of Kent so I still am able to have my fingers in lots of fun research pies. <laughs> so I suppose I d from my career experience, one of the things I might take away from it is that you don't necessarily meet all the criteria on a job description. I certainly didn't know anything about biomedical science. And actually, I, I'm no expert in woodland conservation, but I, you know, if you've got the skills and you can get a lot of skills from academia, through networking, grant management, project management, um, then you can apply all of those skills to, to your career moving forward. Perfect. Thank you very much, Hazel. Moving on to Prue. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so my name is Prue Addison and like Sasha, I also grew up in Australia. Um, and in Australia, I always dreamed of being a marine ecologist. So. First, I started studying marine ecology as a Bachelor of Science degree, and then I moved to conservation science um, through a PhD at the University of Melbourne in Australia. And since then, I've worked in academia, government, private consultancy, and now the charity sector. So I've moved around a bit. Um, so my main passion and the kind of the core theme through my career has been that I really like to apply my scientific background to help develop really practical solutions to environmental challenges. And so some examples, in 2014, for example, I worked on the Great Barrier Reef, where I helped develop a modeling approach to estimate the cost effectiveness of different management interventions in terms of which ones would help improve water quality, restore ecosystem health, or enhance species protection. And that model was then used to help inform decisions about how the Australian government would allocate $140 million worth of public funding to conservation projects. Another example, um, in 2018, when I was in the UK, I was working at the University of Oxford with large corporations to help bring lessons from conservation science um, around how businesses could help mainstream biodiversity in their operations. So here I focused, I focused on corporate biodiversity accountability, and that was really helping businesses understand, uh, measure, evaluate, and report on their own biodiversity performance. 
And so then beyond my applied science passion, I'm also super into strategy and all things big picture and innovation. So at the moment, I'm really interested in conservation finance and how we can really scale up investment in the natural environment. And so in my current position at a local wildlife trust, I am the conservation strategy director. And through this role, I get to develop strategies and test new ideas um, around cool new conservation finance programs. So, I mean, like everyone, I think this is going to be a common theme. My career path has certainly not been a straight line, um, but it's taken me on a very enjoyable journey over 15 years between Australia and the UK. Um, you can check out on my LinkedIn profile. It's a nice ordered, um, you know, CV of what happened. Um, but what I want to share with you is just a few tips um, from what I've learned through my career path. And the first one is rejection is the rule. And I'm not going to write on my LinkedIn profile all the things that I've applied for and ha it hasn't worked, all the grant funding that I've applied for and been rejected for. But I think that having that frame of mind that rejection is the rule, um, it, it just adds to, you know, your it's your journey and don't be crushed by it every single time. It really helps you get to the point to, you know, those great milestones, those successful milestones that you will always have in your career. The next one is, um, like all of us, don't be afraid to move between sectors. Um, I've certainly done it quite a bit. I think that I've learned a lot from switching sectors and it's allowed me to bring a really unique perspective to my jobs um, because of that. Um, my, my final tip is always promote yourself. No one else is going to do it for you. You might be lucky. There might be someone that helps you out, but really just do it yourself start a LinkedIn profile, start a science Twitter account, or even a personal website, um, be discoverable, promote your interests, your experience uh, to help get the jobs that you want. Thanks. Perfect. Thanks, Prue. Moving on to Lisa now. Okay, hi everybody. Um, I hope my laptop isn't making any horrible noises. If it is, just shout and I'll, I'll do something about it. Um, yes, yeah, so um, I'm going to share my screen. Like others have said, um, oops, there we go. Um, so uh, yeah, like others have said, it's a bit, had a slightly strange, um, mixed, very mixed career. I'm quite old, so I've been working in, in ecology and conservation for over 30 years. Um, so I started off with the BSc in Ecology, MSc in Landscape Ecology. I worked for what was then the Nature Conservancy Council, which you'll now know as Natural England. Nottinghamshire County Council is an ecologist, Northumberland Wildlife Trust um, as Conservation Manager. Uh, North and East Yorkshire Ecological Data Centre, then Swift Ecology, which was a consultancy, which I stayed at for 15 years. And then I realised, although it was my company and I ran it, um, I realised I just couldn't stand being a consultant anymore. I needed to go back to my roots. So earlier this year, um, I joined Yorkshire Wildlife Trust. Um, so that's where I am at the moment. And if I can just move this down. So just very quickly, Yorkshire Wildlife Trust is a very big trust, um, one of the biggest in the country. Uh, we've got 100 nature reserves um, and we look after habitats, woodland, wetland, peatland, grassland, um, and we conserve important species. So things like willow tit, otter, waterfall, royal fern. And some of that we do on our reserves, some of it we do in the wider countryside. So it's a very mixed, interesting job. Um, we also do a lot of marine stuff, but we've had quite a bit about marine, so I won't talk about that. And one of the very important things we do is, is introduce other people to, to wildlife and how, that, how important that is. Um, so that's a very important bit of the, bit of the job. Um, the final thing I just want to end up on is to say that as students, you really, and as people wanting a career in conservation or ecology, you really should join SIEM. It's a wealth of information and support. I'm actually the vice president at the moment for England and um, it's really supported me through my very mixed career and it will help you as well. So do go onto the website and have a look um, and see what's what's available there. That's me. Thanks. Thank you very much, Lisa. We're moving on to Rebecca now. Hi, everyone. So I'm relatively early on in my career. I only graduated a year ago with an MSI degree from UCL. And so during my degree, I actually did a summer internship at Kew Gardens. And since graduating, I have now returned to Kew and I'm working as a species conservation assessor. 
And alongside my current job, I've also been continuing to work on the research for my undergraduate project. And I'm also going to be going to Edinburgh soon to start a PhD. But for the sake of time, I'll just focus on my work at Kew for the moment. So my job as a species conservation assessor involves writing extinction risk assessments for plant species. And these assessments will then go onto the IUCN red list, which is the most comprehensive list of the threat status of species. So the specific project that I'm working on is for the threatened plants in Cameroon. And this is part of the Tropical Important Plant Areas or TEPAS project. And so the idea of TEPAS is to identify the areas that are most important for plants based on a set of criteria. And this includes the number of threatened species that occur in each area. So what I'm doing is I am writing the red list assessments that feed into this. And then by identifying these sites as priority areas for conservation, this will then enable the national authorities to prioritise the protection where it's needed. So one example of the importance of this is an area called Ebo Forest, which is an incredibly biodiverse site and it has lots of rare and threatened species, including plants, primates, elephants and many others. But early, earlier this year, the Cameroon government revealed plans to cover the entire forest with logging concessions, which would obviously be devastating for the forest biodiversity, but also for the local communities who rely on the resources and it's their ancestral land. So mine and my colleagues work evidencing the importance of EBO for plants, alongside the work of many other people and institutions across the world helped show the importance of EBO for biodiversity and provided an argument against logging the forest. And actually this then resulted in them cancelling the logging concessions. So I kind of hope that this shows that even by sitting behind a computer in London, you can actually make a practical difference and you can help conservation just from sitting at a computer. And I think this panel really shows like the variety of different jobs that are out there and because I wouldn't have necessarily known that this kind of job was a thing until I did my internship and experienced it. So I think a big bit of advice I would say is try things out, get experience, do an internship, do volunteering, make the most out of your undergraduate or master's project and just try things out and see what you like and get experience in it. And then you might discover something that you didn't know was an option and then you might find you really enjoy it and it can actually make a difference. Mm. So mm. that's, yeah. Thanks Rebecca, that's brilliant. And finally we'll move on to Morvis. Think you might be on mute, Morvis? No, I'm not. Oh, there we go. Uh, uh, sorry about that, um, it's because I've got a separate screen over here. Uh, <laughs> I thought what I'd do is I'd gallop through some animals, because I love animals, I'm passionate about animals, and then try to say where I've gotten to where I am. So. Um, I come from Jamaica and I've been educated there up to my PhD and my passion is marine biology and I started with the smallest little thing you could think of which is uh, nearly Avorosus anus, that was all plankton and then moved on I was interested in reproductive behavior and reproductive strategy in coral reef fish. After 1100 hours underwater with no reproduction in sight but a lot of foraging, my PhD was on feeding and foraging but a fly fish. Um, and one of the things that I noticed in Jamaica was the coral reefs just declining, even in, in, in the time, you know, from when I was a kid to when I was doing my PhD. So I became very interested in conservation, but also coming from a very small island, I needed to broaden my skills and, and my background. And some of the questions I was interested in, because it's behavioral ecology, nutrition, social organization that drives me for conservation in the, in the end. Um, I looked at elephants, I was interested in the female organization in elephants and how food and foraging can affect social organization. 
and then looked in coincidence at the same time trying to in Indonesia uh, with the Indonesian uh, group there to conserve the Buton macaque but um, working on a variety of other um, uh, macaques and, and other primates in uh, Japan and Nepal and Kenya and, and the like. Um, but marine was really my passion, so I was pulled back to this. Um, and I had been in academia for quite a while. And to, to do a lot of the conservation work that you want to, you have to find funds. And finding funds, writing grants is not fun, but it's pretty much the way you have to go. Um, and I found that the university was not a very supportive place for doing that. And so I set up with my partner, uh, Marine Conservation International, to bring the funds ourselves. We had already pulled in several big grants with DEFRA and the like uh, at the universities and decided that we were going to go off and do this ourselves. So, for instance, going off to Pakistan, where they asked us to look at the, the um, cetaceans that they have there because they weren't quite sure what they had. Um, and these are very charismatic species, but also very competitive and people are very protective of, of working with them. That's something that um, with a lot of these big animals that you might need to think about. And I was then interested in, in um, sort of the underdogs, sharks. Sharks, especially when I began, had such a bad press. There were so few of them. They're still being slaughtered like mad. So I started with the biggest one, which is the easier one to think. Huge animal, huge environment very little known. Um, whale sharks we found, for instance, working with them where they were reproducing because in, um, in, the, in the Seychelles where we were working, there were only juveniles. So off of Pakistan, we found that they were actually breeding off of Pakistan. Um, and basking sharks, the numbers were just being slaughtered. Um, and they're slowly coming back now. But one of the things that we did discover, for instance, was the migration pattern, which covers deep ocean, if you wouldn't think, I mean, why would they go there um, rather than around the coast, which is what people thought before. And the, the really nasty ones, the ones with teeth, um, are key to a healthy environment. And I think most people have heard about reefs and the problems that coral reefs are having. Um, and these are some of the top predators on reefs. And we were looking to try and increase marine protected areas, um, both in the Seychelles and in the Cayman Islands using these uh, top predators. Um, so I've also, as I, I said in my biopic, worked in zoos. Um, having moved out of a research institute where they were not interested in conservation at all, I thought that zoos at the time would be really interested in conservation. Just so happens I landed at a really bad time in zoo history. <laughs> so I lasted four years and then went off to try and find someone else who was interested in and would actually help to fund conservation. Um, and that was the University and Research Institute. But as I say, I thought they were not as supportive. It's something you really have to do yourself. But uh, if I could just spend a minute just to reiterate some of the things people were saying is, I think you have to be passionate about what you want to do if you want to see to succeed in these. I mean, it doesn't even matter if it, whether it's conservation or something else. Um, somebody was talking about volunteering. You have to allocate time to this. You can't just be a bunny hugger and say, oh, I really want to do such and such. You have to allocate the time. It, it, you have to be determined. Um, you have to be enthusiastic. You have to keep trying to improve by broadening your skills. Somebody is talking about looking for opportunities. Yes, grab any opportunity that you think. It will help in the end. But somebody very kindly one time when I was trying to get jobs, and as somebody else said, you know, there's an awful lot of rejections out there. Mm -hmm. You have to try and work out where you're going. And somebody very kindly looked at my CV one time as another rejection came through and said, God, you've done a lot of things, but I don't understand where you're going with it. So that's something that you have to maybe think about is, is really think to yourself, where are you going with all this? All of these lovely, wonderful opportunities and skills and all, where is it going for you? That's it. Fantastic. Thanks, Marlis. So we've heard from all nine speakers now. Thank you very much for that. That was fantastic to hear all of your, all your stories. 
Um, if anyone in the audience does have any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, but I'll hand over to Hannah now um, to lead with a, with a couple of questions. Okay, so personally, I would like to know what are some of the struggles you've had to face uh, to get where you are and how did you overcome these? Whoever wants to answer, please uh, pick up the question. Uh, Lisa, yeah. Yeah, this might sound a little bit surprising, um, but and as I say, I've been in conservation for a long time, um, but I, I experienced quite a bit of sexism, not that in itself probably isn't surprising, but also quite a bit of sexual harassment, um, which was at the time sort of just ignored by my, um, by my peers, just laughed off and, uh, you know, well, you just, it's just part of the job, you have to live with it. Um, so that was quite hard. Um, but I mean, I wouldn't put up with it now, but I was young at the time and, you know, trying to trying to make my way in the world. Um, so, yeah, so that's been quite hard. And it, as a, others have said, there is a lot of rejection. You have to work hard. You have to put in the hours. OK. <laughs> um, so what is uh, one of the most favourite projects you've worked on? If anyone has any interesting projects. I'll go on that one if you like. I was lucky enough to work on the endangered black parrot in the Seychelles at the time. Um, <clears throat> it was thought to be a subspecies of, I think, four subspecies of black parrot that was spread across Seychelles, Grand Comores, and Madagascar. Uh, on the Seychelles, I don't know if you know much about them, but there's maybe less than 500 in a, on just one island prowling on the Seychelles. Uh, there are invasive ringlet parakeets that were on the Seychelles, so they were a real disease risk, as we've seen on Mauritius with uh, echo parakeets. Anyway, so I, I was um, lucky enough to work on a genetics and sort of evolutionary study where I looked at uh, their evolutionary history. So I studied live birds and birds, historic birds from the um, sort of various natural history museums, and I reconstructed their evolutionary history, did some morphological work and actually demonstrated that they were, um, the ones on the Seychelles were incredibly different genetically, uh, morphologically, and ultimately they got relisted and became full species status, which um, some people here will know that's really important when it comes to conservation and conservation funding. So uh, that was a real big win for the Seychelles and protection of their um, endemic, wonderful black parrot. So that was a real win for me. Thank you, that's really interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Okay, we have some uh, questions in the chat. Amy would like to know, as people without any experience or degrees as of yet, how do you recommend we get our foot in the door if people are rejecting us due to not having experience? Do I have I'll a go at that one? Go. Should I go first? Oh, sorry. Yeah, go for it. Uh, I guess, yeah, just to say, I see that you've commented that volunteering overseas is expensive. Um, actually, when you asked what, what can be hard about getting into conservation, my thought was finances. Um, I wasn't lucky enough to you know, come from a, a well-off background. So actually, I was really worried about money uh, when I was getting into for my degree. So I worked a lot, saved up a lot. And when it came to volunteering, I knew I had to have a bit of money behind me to afford to be unpaid. Um, so yeah, it just kind of held things up for me for a few years, but it was the only way I could personally afford it. I think volunteering is essential. You shouldn't assume that you need to pay a lot of money to volunteer though. I feel really strongly about that. Your time is incredibly valuable. There's some great volunteering in the UK. Um, don't assume you need to go overseas, although it can be glamorous. Um, I mentioned Marish Wildlife Foundation. That's where I volunteered overseas. I didn't pay to do that volunteering experience um, and it was brilliant. So, you know, you just have to maybe be a bit more discerning about where you're looking. Um, I know, for example, RSPB offer some great volunteer placements and I would be wrong not to mention that Marine Conservation Society do as well. I, I will add to that on volunteering, if that's all right, because I did quite a lot because I was never going to kind of accept what was just made available, I think. So when it came to um, well, my first my first work in South America was voluntary, but I went to my supervisors who I'd absolutely loved and said, who around the world needs the skills that you have just taught me? And I went to those people and said, do you need a geneticist? And if you're free, then yes, come for it. So I did have to find, now I think I paid half my flight, they paid half my flight. 
and I did the first bit for nothing. And the stuff I was talking about in Australia when I had my revelation about um, about free dive, people being interested in free diving, I had just moved back to Australia and I was struggling a bit to get into research there because obviously I was into kind of sharks and things and there's a big lots of competition between people wanting to get into that field. Um, so I just started that volunteer group of my own accord. I knew that I had the skills to look at seagrass. I worked on that before and you had a range of skills and that there was stuff that we could gather data that was practically useful. So I thought about it, but that was just gathering other people and creating something from nothing. So it is possible also to just create your own opportunities. Um, it does help to find people who are interested in supervising it, but um, yeah, make your own. And this country has got lots of lots of things to do. I'm just about to fly around the country. I've been just about to fly around the country looking at exactly that, what needs to be done around um, around the UK. Uh, and I, oh. <laughs> Sorry. I guess this is a good topic, but it's coming up again um, a lot in the questions anyway. So I think it is um, also thinking about what skills that you can develop that are going to bring something to volunteering. So um, a lot of organisations will really benefit from either communication skills or statistical skills, uh, particularly um, a, a number of um, field-based operations. They're very good at collecting data, but less good at, um, at being able to do good stuff with it all the time. So just think about the, you know, building up your skill sets in those areas and thinking about what you can offer. Be really careful when you're paying for volunteering to make sure that you know um, what you are doing and what the organization is doing. There's a right old mixed bag out there um, of, of quality um, and experience. So talk to people who've been with that organization before, make sure you get lots of um, information about it. And I think there are, as well as um, working um, in the UK where there are fantastic opportunities and it can be small part-time stuff. I think a number of us were obviously not in a you know, financial position when we were younger to volunteer full-time. So it's what can you do around the edges um, of a paid job. Um, and also I would really recommend going back to that initial um, question about getting a job in the first place is spend, I get so frustrated looking at CVs. Um, so really spend the time on your CV and covering letter and don't devalue jobs that you think aren't important. Like if I see somebody who's been working nights to earn money in a restaurant, I know they are good with people. I know that they've dealt with some difficult situations. I know that they can work hard. And as much, a lot of us that have presented um, tonight are talking about stuff that comes down to common sense, good um, people skills, um, and a lot of stuff that's beyond, is, is just, you know, being, um, practical as well as being you know the scientific and academic training that you get through your degrees so ne don't undervalue those skills that you're getting through doing these mix of jobs but think about how they're relevant when you're applying to that job and make sure you tailor your application from that for that job and avoid silly you know sort of mistakes in um, spelling and you can you can spot the you know where people have just been rushing through lots of applications and really sympathize but if it's the application coming to you you've got lots of applications and you're trying to find weaknesses which is what we end up doing then you have to make some tough choices so it really is the case of the people who've thought about the job they're applying for and what skills they bring and being honest about where you don't have the skills but what attributes you personally have that you think will um you know that you're keen to work on and avoid cliches as well so think about it everybody can work well on their own or well in a team um, according to every letter I get and if you ever interviewed with a job for me and this is one I'd really encourage you to think about I will always ask one question is how do you define conservation and most people in that interview situation will go completely shocked and completely stunned and and fluster around trying to answer that question now it is a personal thing, conservation, and that it comes round to that broad church of what conservation is. Um, but what does conservation mean to you? How do you define it? And why do you want that as your career? Because I know for a fact, you'll have written an application letter that says you're passionate about conservation and you want a career in conservation, but what is that? And what does it mean to you? And why do you want that? And that will help define 
as uh, Mova said, those steps to get there. Um, I actually have something just to add quickly onto what Heather was saying as well um, around volunteering um, and paying to volunteer too, because we charge for our volunteering opportunities, but it's important to um, understand because it is such a mixed bag, right? Like when you look up volunteering online, <laughs> especially volunteering abroad, it is really mixed and it's really important to navigate that carefully because unfortunately there are some not so great organizations out there. Um, so I think important things to know, if you're going to pay for it, you need to know where that money's going, right? So like the reason that we charge for our opportunities is because we rent our accommodation, we rent our uh, food and we rent our dives. So um, we have to pay rent, which means we have to uh, charge people to cover that, those costs. Um, and we have to rent our tanks and the boat and all that kind of stuff. But there are some organizations out there that will like have host accommodation. So they, uh, so you sleep in like um, the local people's houses and they can get paid very rubbish for that. Uh, and you can pay like upwards of three grand for that. And it's really important to be aware of where your money's going and also be aware of the ethics of the organization too, um, because there's lots of legal legalities in the UK around going abroad and doing volunteer work abroad uh, for health and safety, which is great. We do need that. But in terms of ethics, it's all down to the country that you're going to and the laws within that country um, and the ethics around the animal interactions in that country may not match where you come from uh, and so especially for, for us like we found this a lot in South Africa is one of the like most unethical places in terms of animal interactions um, and you get like a lot of like canned hunting and uh, organizations that advertise themselves as conservation organizations but actually the animals are money makers um, and you can go and volunteer and think you're doing good and unfortunately we've uncovered a few different organizations like that but quite frankly shocking that people are um okay with lying <laughs> about what they're doing um so if you are going to volunteer pay to volunteer abroad um then please do watch out but um as tara said there's plenty of opportunities locally as well um and that will often be cheaper because you don't have to afford the accommodation um and the food because you can live at home while volunteering locally as well so if you're on a tight budget there's just as much value within that you don't need to go abroad um so yeah that was just my my two pence on volunteering abroad. Thank you for that. That's some really interesting and great advice. So we have a question from Tom, which is a two-parter. Um, he's asking um, whether anyone had, so, I was just wondering whether anyone had some experience as tips studying a PhD or similar abroad and if they had any ideas on gaining skills and experience with the current situation, so like home-based volunteer and remote volunteering. On the, um, the home, well, COVID lockdown situation, you can certainly always volunteer for your local wildlife trust. Um, which I, I can see Lisa's like replying in everyone's messages in the chat box. Um, and you can be outside too. So there are lots of wildlife trusts. Uh, we're super careful about health and safety, but there are opportunities when we come out of lockdown. And I would really encourage, as an Australian who has ended up in the UK, um, we did all of our volunteering just locally. Um, and there's, there's nothing wrong with doing volunteering locally. In fact, particularly if you're going to end up doing a job in the UK, it's probably good to show that you've got some interest in UK conservation. I think on that as well, so Lisa is actually from Yorkshire Wildlife Trust and I believe a lot of the audience will be within the Yorkshire catchment. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sure Lisa will have some, uh, some insight on that. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we rely on volunteers. We have an awful lot of them doing all sorts of things, for, as other people said, from desk-based data entry and helping out in the office to coming out on reserves. And we, we have, we've gone through the whole sort of 
COVID secure way of working. So there are only certain voluntary activities that we have been allowing. Um, but where we have been allowing them, then obviously we've been taking very, very important precautions. At the moment, our events and stuff are closed down for obvious reasons. But once they start back up again, then, then that will be a big opportunity. So yeah, I mean, wherever you are, do get in touch with your local wildlife trust and um, see what they've got on offer because there, there will be, there's always plenty of opportunities. Thank you. So um, Jodie's asking, how did you financially fund yourself at the start of your careers when most things are voluntary based or have you had to pay to do so? I, I worked a lot when I did my PhD. I didn't get full funding for my PhD. I worked my way through it. I did, a, I, I did get a graduate teaching scholarship which just paid my fees. And other than that, I worked my backside off basically whilst doing my PhD. I actually did, I intermitted from a year, uh, for, for a year from my, no, not a year, a few months during my PhD to do a postdoc, weirdly, but any kind of opportunity to come up to do some, some work and earn some money whilst I was doing it. I ended up doing paid lecturing on top of it. Um, yeah, so it, it, I've, I've just basically worked as much as possible probably why i've had lots of varied careers which i didn't even tell you about today and some really even more obscure ones um but yeah work 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 um and my volunteering experience a lot of it was local so you know i i, I volunteered with the bumblebee conservation trust in kent so my weekends were spent out running events or doing some site surveys for reintroductions um so anything that i could do voluntarily local and then work on the side um to see myself through that's pretty much what i did yeah for me i started love the oceans while i was at uni so my student loan covered me for most of it and then i worked um to earn money for the rest of it and then started lto like while i was still at uni so for me there was i didn't have to worry too much because i went straight into it <laughs> um but uh yeah work is how there are also there are some paid opportunities out there like Q's internships are now actually paid and they offer both summer internships and sandwich placements so when I did it they were voluntary but now they're actually paying them so there are some opportunities out there if you look for them but obviously they are competitive but it's worth applying there's no harm in applying and trying and I think as well there's no harm in emailing people if you're interested in their work if you just email saying, I'm really interested in what you do, are there any opportunities with you? Like, there's no harm in doing that at all and only good will come out of it. So just take opportunities and make opportunities if you can. Yeah, I think the fact that we're all here tonight is because we really care about um, the opportunities that all of you have. Um, and we really want to see, um, you know, you thrive and, and develop careers in conservation. Um, also, social media is a really good way of engaging with people. Um, it might be feel less intimidating to um, connect or, or sort of tag somebody uh, through a Twitter conversation than it is through, um, you know, emailing somebody directly. Um, and I, I drown in emails, so I'm terrible at, the, at responding. But so be persistent. It's not because I don't want to. It's because um, so never be afraid to just follow up with in inquiries. But I think building a social media profile, particularly in a scientific conservation um, way, um, either on Twitter or Instagram, is a really, really good way of um, telling your story of what you're interested in and what you're doing and then looking at also other people and organizations and what they're doing and who are the people that and organizations that resonate with you and sort of doing things that you're excited by and then that starts to build and help refine your interests and then connect with those people we're not you know people who are in the conservation field um, are passionate about that, what they do and love nothing more than talking to other people who are equally passionate so um and and it's certainly going to a lot of it is going to depend on um, continuing the momentum. I mean, I, when I went to university, there weren't degrees in conservation, so that's how much it's changing. But obviously the world is still facing huge problems. And so we need um, more and more people engaging in the diverse ways of, of conservation that you've heard this evening. Thank you. 
Okay, so Alice is asking, are consultancy skills useful within the conservation sector? I think that you can bring almost any skill. I mean, we had a, a student recently who came from a legal background and she was a godsend to help us write policies for um, legislation in Cayman Islands, for instance. So yes, um, pretty much any skill. <laughs> Um, there may be degrees on conservation now, but that, that doesn't cover, I'm sure it can't cover all of the skills that, that you can bring to um, conservation. Can I just add to that? I just, I'm so passionate about that and what you've just said, because I think people sometimes struggle to see the skills they've got if they're not directly in that field. So, you know, the job I've got now, which is very strategic, it's lots of leadership and, and that kind of thing, I probably wouldn't have got, had I not accidentally spent eight years in the civil service managing a team of tech collectors. Um, so, you know, I think just really think about all those uh, skills that you get from everything that you do and, and take hold of all the opportunities that come your way. Do lots of presentations, manage projects, all of those things are skilled that can be, applied, uh, can be applied to any job in conservation. And, you know, actually one of the things that the reason why I did a genetics PhD, despite what my love of primates and my ongoing love of primates, is that I actually wanted a skill rather than being restricted to a species. And that's led me to being able to work with so many different things. And there's so much wonderful biodiversity on this planet. I just, you know, I would, I would always encourage you to think broadly and think widely. Uh, just to add to that, I can remember um, when I was uh, doing a, an undergraduate, well, no, yeah, but I was still an undergraduate in France. Um, and I've been working on the butterfly fish for my PhD when I got up to the PhD. And the person I was working with at the museum, the head of the museum there, kept saying to me, um, yeah, but what animal are you interested in? I said, well, I'm interested in the habitat and all this. And he says, yeah, but what animal? You had to be so specific then, you know, and that's not the case. It, it doesn't help to be, you know, so specific anymore. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I see that Lisa is replying to questions in the chat, but I have one here from Amy saying she understands the importance of volunteering in the UK. However, following on from what Francesca said, are there any organisations that you in particular recommend? So when you're volunteering abroad? Love the oceans. Because of the problems with this. <laughs> Of course, we recommend ourselves. There are um, some, so we actually have some guidelines on our website for ethical volunteering and how to watch out for the pitfalls that some organisations can uh, fill. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's loads of, uh, there's literal ton of organizations out there. I check out, there's like wiseoceans.org or no.com and conservation careers as well. And they have loads. They don't do a vetting process. So you need to vet the organizations yourself. Um, but I would vet them against, um, we have three criteria that I talk about when I talk about volunteering abroad. So you have the financial side of things, you have the health and safety side of things, and you have the ethics side of things. So you need to vet, vote, you need to vet whatever organization you're going to go with against those three criteria. And if they can't give you straight answers, um, especially about the finances and the ethics, then um, don't go with them because they've got something to hide. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, the health and safety side, um, you're actually legally obliged to abide by most of that if you're a UK registered organisation. If you're looking at an organisation that is registered in whatever country you're going to, um, then they won't be legally obliged um, to abide by the same health and safety. Um, so it is worth looking at where the organisation is registered and what health and safety and stuff they might be um, have to abide by. Uh, but yeah, check the ethics, check the finances uh, and check the health and safety. That's my input there. Thank you for that. That's really um, useful information. So um, Nina is asking, 
does anyone recommend any online resources to gain experience while the field is still a bit uncertain with COVID? I think the great, the positive thing, the great thing, that's wrong. <laughs> positive thing about COVID is everything is online and a lot of things that were paid for conferences that would have been expensive or exclusive are now accessible to all. Um, so it is a great way of, um, you know, connecting with people, listening to a diversity of things. And also you can listen to them anywhere in the world. So yes, some are, um, you know, some are fee based um, because they still take costs in organizing, but a lot are not. We're running um, Reef Conservation UK, which is um, for people, researchers working across the UK and conservationists. And I think the registration three is three pounds. Um, that's in early December, but there is a huge amount of online free um, stuff. So to spend some time looking, a lot of it's early evenings or lunch times. So if it works around other commitments, um, it also gives you with chat functions like this, an opportunity to um, raise your voice and show who you are and ask some interesting questions and connect with people who are running those events. One thing from um, from a point of view of a, of a user, I don't know what the other, what the, um, what the, the end of the system is for applying, but I use them, there's a UN database of volunteers. So when I've needed um, advice or help from, because I'm working on flyaway things, if I need some advice on um, what kind of culturally do people think about, say, vultures in India, as an example, I have used the UN database. I've gone on there to find um, people also for a web, when I needed some volunteers to help out on website, I went also through the UN system and found brilliant volunteers through that. I know there's a lot of people on it, but there are global opportunities that come up through it. So I don't know what it's like to use it because I've never used that end and it's kind of filtered for me through my UN contact, but um, that might be also a useful resource. There's also a lot of online courses available. For example, there's a website called Conservation Training where they have a load of courses, including on the red listing process. And there's things like that that you can just do yourself on your own and just sign up for the website and take the course. And there's a lot of different free courses around if you look for them. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so just to finish off, because I can see the um, questions in the chat are being answered. So just to wrap everything up, what is your ultimate top tip uh, for getting into a conservation career as an undergrad? or as um, a student? I think someone said it already, but make your own opportunities. That and I, I mean, this is maybe slightly, uh, I just, I actually, somebody said, be very sure about where you're going. And I have to say the, the liberty for me came when I stopped being too scared about that, the certainty of it. Um, as I used to compete at maths and things, I was kind of always being pushed down to be highly intellectual. And then eventually I just realized actually follow what your kind of your brain says is important, what your heart feels like, that just feels like the right thing to do and where you've got skills. And I've just kept on like mushing those together at each phase and gone, right, what do I feel like I could really be good at now? But I also haven't been scared to try something completely different. So flying, I used to be petrified of flying. And then I realized I needed aerial photos of wetlands to make them come to life. So I kind of followed that. But for me, it was like, and I definitely told myself in Suriname once at 21 going, what the hell am I going to do with my life? Um, I definitely said, I'm going to experiment until I'm 30. And by the time I'm 30, I'm going to know what, I'll, what, I'll be, <laughs> what my right career path is. And I think I've kind of found the sort of the right thing. Um, but yeah, um, it's a fascinating journey, whatever you end up choosing to do. I just wanted to say that one of the things that people often ask is, um, at an interview is, where do you want to be in five years' time? And that's such a hard thing because it just depends where the opportunity takes you sometimes. Yeah, for me, I would say resilience is um, the absolute key. Uh, you need a lot of resilience working in conservation, um, whether that be from individual projects, from rejections from different organizations, or just like I must have been told upwards of 150 times in my lifetime that I can't do what I'm doing um, or that I won't succeed. So you just go and keep doing it 
and you'll eventually get there. Um, so I would say just make the most of all the opportunities that come your way. If you have the opportunity to do summer placements or internships or your research projects, just make the most of all those opportunities that you get. And also, as people have already said, don't take it to heart if you get rejected from things. Everyone gets rejected from most things they apply for. And it's just the way it is. It's nothing about you personally. So I think just keep trying and you will get something and things will work out if you keep at it. And I think we are always looking for that um, little bit extra that you have gone out of your way. That doesn't mean the paid volunteering at all. It just means that you're, if you believe in conservation, it's also how you walk the talk as well as the study. So what you do, um, you know, it can be small initiatives. You know, I go and clean up litter every week in my streets or I go and, you know, do something helpful in the community or you do something online or it's just that little bit extra that shows that you are really trying and caring and sort of building up your career and also making connections. Um, so I think looking at the, the people and the organisations that you are interested in and spending time researching those, that applies for where you're looking at volunteering opportunities as well as work opportunities. Um, and then showing that you've done that research really, really helps when you're applying. Um, as we said, a lot more internships are paid now, which is how it should be. Um, a lot of those are now part time to allow people to also work with them as well. Um, but they are still competitive. So we're always looking for that little bit extra um, of what people have done. And, and that doesn't need to be much. It's just um, showing that you're really committed to that career. Um, and, and that it can be in it, all of its diversity of what it, what it you know, does. One of the things I'm always really impressed with when I'm looking at a job application is if someone is quite open and honest about a skill or a bit of knowledge that they don't have and, and says how they're going to change it. What I don't like is when people just skip over it and hope that I won't notice. You know, so I think be brave, be bold, go for a job where you might not fit all the criteria, but actually show how you're going to develop that, that skill or that learning and knowledge. And to me, that's always, you know, that recognition and that, that demonstration that you're going to be proactive in, in is always is far more impressive than trying to pretend it's not there. I think the other thing with, um, if you're going on to job applications or just trying to get volunteering or, or whatever, is to read up ahead about, about the person or the organization that you're looking into. Don't just say, oh, I really love sparks or whatever. Have no idea anything more than that, what we do or what we might be able to offer. Um, it doesn't help, it doesn't go over well. And just on that a little bit more, I know conservation is a massive, like there's so many things that you can do, but you kind of have to just pick a few things that you're interested in to just pursue, reach out to people. Even if you've got a few different things on the go at the same time and you're applying for different sorts of jobs, just remember which, who you're talking to about what, but you've kind of sh got to show that you're passionate, that you're not just like, oh yeah, I just want any job in conservation. That's not going to convince anyone to employ you. So be a bit more specific. Fantastic. Uh, and there are jobs. <laughs> I mean, the fact that there are multiple organisations now working in conservation and the mixed bag that there are, there are jobs and we are hiring and there are stuff. So keep your, there's like conservation jobs on Twitter. There's, you know, follow that, um, those threads and, and sign up to some of the lists um, that are sharing jobs. And that also starts to show you the range of jobs that are out there. And you think, wow, that's that's what I'd love to do. That's my dream job. Um, or that looks interesting. So it's not all dependent on volunteering. It, it, there are jobs. <laughs> so <laughs> don't, don't despair completely. <laughs> there are, as Heather says, a lot more jobs. I mean, actual conservation jobs now. Um, and, and she's right about checking uh, what you'd like to do and maybe also look to see what skills you'd need to get that particular job or, or that area and, and maybe apply that. Fantastic. 
well, we've gone a little over. Apologies um, to to the speakers. I did say seven seven pm, but uh, we are, we'll tie it up there. Um, and yeah, I'll sh send this recording um, round to everyone that attended and put it on YouTube, probably on the Leeds Biosoc account, so you can all watch it back. Um, so yeah, all that's left to say is just a huge a huge thank you to uh, all the panelists. It's it's been incredible to hear all your your insights and your stories. Um, I keep looking up here, sorry, I've got on my <laughs> um, Yeah, it's been fantastic to hear all your stories and we, we really do appreciate it. I'm sure everyone in the audience has, has found some benefit from it. Um, and any contact details, anyone in the audience, if you would like a specific panelist contact details, please reach out to Leith Biosoc and we can share them with you if the panelists are happy to do so. Um, but yeah, apart from that, thank you very much again. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for the invitation and organising it. To... No worries at all. Yeah, thanks for having us. That's great. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.